Yeah, I love demo days, and I like them even more when I'm not demoing. So, <laughs> so um, I want to just spend a few minutes. We've got, uh, we'll spend about a half an hour just talking about uh, angel investing. And, uh, you know, hopefully what I'll be able to do is give you some data and information, some anecdotes and stories that will help convince you that right now is a great time to make money with startup companies. Um, since I uh, sold uh, the, the medical IT company I was involved with, uh, Sweet Flight Diabetes Care, I sold that about two years ago, and I've uh, been able to shift my attention to, uh, to uh, investing and looking at capital formation and how that can really help push um, uh, the whole ecosystem along. I, I find it really interesting that um, you, know, you, you probably, if, you, if you're involved in investing, actually, how many people here have one or more investments in a startup? Okay, that's great. And how many folks are currently with a company looking potentially for investments? Okay? And I assume the rest of you are with service organizations that pay for lunch. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, in, in, in the uh, venture arena right now is kind of interesting because it's judged on a usually a 10 year trailing basis. And the aughts were not a great decade for private equity. So I am very much convinced, and I'll share some data with you that I hope will convince you that in fact we're at a, in the midst of the start of a real renaissance in startups, and that for a lot of reasons, um, a lot of wealth is going to be created in new companies, and it's happening just when there's actually a deinvestment in general around venture. Because if you look back over 10 years, uh, venture investing has been, uh, has trailed almost every other asset class. If you go back a few years, that 10-year trailing actually showed a loss in venture investment. So right when we now have, uh, in the last few years, uh, we've lost uh, about half of the venture capital funds. There's about half as many venture capital funds now as there were 10 years ago. There's actually about half as many public companies as there were 10 years ago. So we're kind of in a down cycle from an investment standpoint, but we're just at the beginning of a, of a real renaissance in, uh, in venture. Uh, or in startups. Um, so I think that, that really represents a big opportunity to be able to make some money uh, investing right now. Let me start though by stepping back a little bit. I um, uh, had the opportunity to, to work with a number of companies in San Francisco before moving up here in 2005. When I moved up here, what I heard, and I'm sure you guys have all heard the story before, that Portland and the, the, the greater uh, Portland metro, and certainly Oregon in general, it's a great place to live, but it's not a great place to grow a company. Um, and uh, the, there were a couple of things that really struck me when I, when I moved here that I think anecdotally point to what uh, Portland and Oregon have as their greatest asset right now. Uh, the first thing that surprised me, I was, when I moved here, I was uh, running a group at Avaya, um, a multinational company. We had uh, offices all over the world. My group actually got the majority of our revenue out of Europe. So I spent most of my time on a plane. And whether I was in San Francisco or Portland didn't really make that much difference from the from my professional standpoint. And uh, the thing that struck me when I first moved here was I I actually was uh, spending less time at the front of the plane. So I you know at the time I was flying 150,000 miles a year. I was the kind of person that airlines love, and I was used to being treated really well. And when I moved here, I actually found that I was getting upgraded less, which I found a little bit puzzling. And uh, both United and Lufthansa were customers of mine, and I had the opportunity to share this with one of their executives uh, at dinner one night. And the United executive said, yeah, well, you know, uh, Portland's a small hub, but we actually have one of the largest proportion of elite flyers coming out of Portland than anywhere ever does. And I, you know, I thought that was interesting, that a lot of people were living in Portland but working elsewhere. And it was further confirmed because not only wasn't I getting to the front of the plane, but I wasn't even getting exit row seats. Right? You, know, seats that, you know, there are like first class seats only without the booze and good food. And uh, you know, because they were taken by flight crews and flight attendants returning from their shifts. And uh, as I talked to them, I found that this is like a favorite place for flight attendants to live. So they were choosing to live in Portland. They could, they could you know, travel about the country any way they wanted. And uh, Portland was the place they were choosing to come. And when you drill into the numbers over the last 10 years, what you find is, in fact, what Portland has been doing is successfully importing young, educated people. 
And in fact, the demographics favor Portland in just a tremendous way. And you, when you drill into these numbers, proportionally, we have more college-educated young people moving into this <coughs> area um, than almost any other metro in the US. And uh, in fact, this is a report that came out of Portland State that, that drills into exactly that. You know, you see it in the, in the papers um, on, a, on a pretty regular basis. Um, and uh, this is actually a, um, just the other day, I went to a uh, meetup. And uh, this is the 62 people attending a tech meetup. And the thing that struck me about this, you probably can't read some of these, but you know, first of all, there's 62 people going to a tech meetup. <clears throat> That's, you know, something's going on here. But when you read through these, the number of people that just recently moved to Portland and are looking for something to do, um, you know, is, is, is pretty interesting. People move here because they want to live here, they move here even without a job. And, uh, you know, I know Portlandia lampoons that as them coming here to retire. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think that's true. You know, maybe they're, you're windsurfing in the gorge. Um, but they're also looking to start businesses. Um, and they're really setting this, this uh, uh, it is a, a population migration graph for the Portland Metro. And you can see that what the people who are moving into Portland are in fact those 18 to 35 year olds generally with college educations. Um, and uh, you know, interestingly, uh, the established population isn't leaving. And we're not attracting older people like Arizona, right? This is a great demographic base to build from. And that is uh, what we've been seeing over the last five years, is really capitalizing on this young educated population who are looking to, to do things. What we've uh, very successfully done over the last five years is build a very robust ecosystem to help those motivated young people to start new businesses. So we have, uh, together, many people in the room, as well as uh, lots of effort from nonprofits, from government, from uh, interested individuals. We've built incubators, we've built accelerators, uh, we've put seed funding together, um, we've gotten support organizations, and this isn't unique to Portland. I think Portland's one of about a half dozen tech centers across the country that have really seen a resurgence and a renaissance in uh, tech startups. And we're the beneficiary of this, and to a great extent, we're the beneficiary of maintaining this great uh, standard of living combined with a reasonable uh, cost of living that has attracted uh, people here. So the, um, what, what the result of all of this is, um, is that we're now minting about 100 companies a year. You're going to see six of them today. Um, and, uh, and I don't see an end of this in, in, in the near future. You know, if you look at how active the incubators are, uh, we're continuing to get people who are both fresh to the area as well as uh, coming out of places like Mentor and Intel who are looking to do interesting things. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's any end in sight in terms of the entrepreneurial energy that is now going into uh, starting companies and, and uh, starting businesses. Um, and we're beginning to really see the fruits of that. So one of the big wraps that Portland has always had is that you can't make money in, in, uh, in Portland, you can't make money in Oregon, that, you know, yeah, there's some startups and there's been some money put to work, but, you know, we just haven't had the exits. And that's really beginning to change. So the ecosystem that we've built is beginning to pay off. So just in the last few years, you know, we've seen a, a very significant year-over-year -year increase in terms of exits. Um, and we're seeing some momentum in terms of the businesses that we are building. Um, so, you know, last year alone, 2012, uh, we had uh, a number of exits that I think are, are typical of really what's going on in this cycle. That what has uh, happened is that the advent of new technologies, and I think that the most influential ones right now are mobile, social and cloud are radically changing the way we do things. And they're changing the way we do things so fast that uh, traditional or, or you know, the incumbents have had a very hard time uh, keeping up. So their response 
is to go find nimble companies who have been doing it for them and acquiring those. And even though uh, you know we haven't really seen a robust return of the public markets, we have seen a robust return of M&A activity. And this is providing the ability for investors to see exits and uh, to make money. So you know some of the folks on this list, uh, you know like Tripwire and Cryptic, they've been companies, businesses that have been in town for quite some time. And you could you know look at that and say there's some pent up uh, you know inventory of businesses that uh, are looking to uh, to find a new home. But I, I think other companies on this list, um, you know, represent a new generation of companies coming along. Folks like uh, Small Society, um, which does mobile applications, they're now. Walmart Labs, so they're doing mobile applications for the largest retailer in the country. Again, something that Walmart couldn't grow themselves, but could uh, certainly be in a position to take advantage of. Um, my company, Sweet Spot, uh, we are a cloud uh, data management system and, and cloud analytics system that a medical device manufacturer saw advantage in, uh, in acquiring, and we're now their software arm, primarily because they were not able to move quick enough to take advantage of the cloud. Um, so you go down this, look, Gift Tango Incom has come into town. Gift Tango is the, um, does uh, stored value. Incom is one of the largest stored value providers in the country. So, you know, we're seeing a model of folks with the talents around mobile, cloud, social, starting new businesses here, being well supported by the ecosystem, and really playing crucial roles in assisting in uh, building new ways of doing business as they integrate into larger companies. And I also think like Jive, we're going to see some uh, <coughs> some IPOs in the, in the coming days. In fact, we've got uh, a whole uh, you know, group of high growth companies right now that have found uh, ready access to capital, have seen uh, triple digit growth. These are companies that are doubling and tripling year over year. And uh, you know, I think we're going to see some some uh, very significant exits in the coming years when these companies continue to drive this uh, this whole ecosystem. So as as you look at young companies and you think about how you might be able to participate in those, um, you know, in terms of what do seed investments look like today, let me just spend a little bit of time running through some stats. These are nationwide stats as to what. C deals look like on average, um, uh, and uh, give you an idea. You know, I'm sure, like I like I saw some of you are writing checks um, uh, at the moment. Uh, you know, and probably have seen some of these metrics. Generally speaking, the Portland metro is a little behind the national numbers in terms of uh, you know kind of each of these metrics. But this gives you an idea of kind of what's the standard across the board nationwide. <coughs> so in terms of uh, first rounds, so these are generally C rounds. Uh, you know, nationally, it's a little over half a million dollars is what a, what a typical seed round looks like. Um, the data shows that that's pretty evenly split right now between debt and equity. So about half of those are price rounds, half of those are convertible debt. Um, and again, uh, you know, I don't have all of the data, but my, uh, my belief is that uh, Greater Portland Metro and, and, uh, and Oregon, including uh, Eugene Bend and the Gorge, are probably running maybe 30% below these numbers. In terms of average pre-money valuation, two and a half is pretty much the mean nationwide. Um, you know, if you look across this, you know, the, uh, the Bay Area is certainly in the top quartile in terms of valuation, and I think we're probably in the, uh, you know, in, in the, the first lower quartile in terms of uh, in terms of valuation. But this is uh, this is typical. And then in terms of uh, distribution of returns. When you look at all the numbers, uh, and this data comes from uh, Rob Wilbank, I, I'm uh, you know happy to, to liberate, uh, or liberally borrow from Rob's data. If you haven't seen it, he's uh, he's at Atlantic University, probably has the best collection of angel data on the planet. I don't think it hurts that he's got you know an army of graduate students who help him collect that. Uh, the I think the notable numbers here that are very interesting is that the uh, average holding period to a return for a investor is three and a half years. Um, the bulk of those returns are uh, are not much higher than, than 1x, uh, certainly between uh, 1x and 2x. 
Um, but a good portion of them are seeing multiples and, and returns. And the thing that struck me about these numbers is that it's a relatively short holding period. So the, uh, the way that an angel investor can make money is by building a portfolio of investments that can see as a portion of those investments uh, a return across this, uh, this spectrum. When you uh, drill into Rob's data, uh, there's a few things that really jump out in terms of what is it that um, you know makes for uh, makes for quality investments and uh, relatively high returns. Um, and I'm sure you've seen some of these before. Um, the the first one is to invest in what you know, right? Identify those areas where you have expertise, where you understand the business, and uh, make investments uh, where you're comfortable that you understand uh, standard business metrics and multiples and understand that the folks that you're investing in are doing the things that you would expect of people in that, in that area. Um, and in fact, of, uh, of all the data on angel investing, that's the highest correlative data in terms of uh, determinant returns on your investment. That the closer you are to your own expertise, the more likely you are to see, to see returns. Um, the, the second item, and this is uh, somewhat common sense, is spend time with the startup. So especially if you're investing in something that you know, then you have the opportunity to provide some value to add. Uh, but more importantly, you have the opportunity to stay close to the investment. Um, and uh, you know, as you make those Investments, you can uh, you know you can really pay attention to what to what those your portfolio companies are doing. And then the third item, and, and uh, you know I think this is one of the hardest ones for angel investors is to think of it as a uh, portfolio investment. That the uh, Rob's <laughs> data shows really really clearly that um, your ability to make a return on your investments, uh, you know generally isn't going to look good until you have uh, about six investments. That um, you need to know that several of these are not going to return capital um, and approach it that way. So the, the, the best way to make money as an angel investor, and again this comes right out of Rob's data, is to be an active angel investor, to allocate enough of your resources so that you can participate as an angel and be able to make investments. Usually angel investments are in the 25K range, 25 to 50K range. Um, so make three to four investments a year and be able to maintain that uh, level of investment and, and treat it as a portfolio. Um, so I, you know, I, I hear anecdotes about people who um, you know, find themselves in a position to make some investments. They'll usually invest in a company. They'll have a bad experience. And they'll look at that as, uh, you know, something that indicates that this is just not a place to make money. And I would actually argue that, that generally that's just not approaching it correctly. That, uh, you know, the fact is investments are going to um, uh, not pan out some of the time. Stats show that it's uh, maybe half the time, if not a little more than half the time. So you need to be able to approach it knowing that that's the case and build a, uh, a portfolio of investments. So I think that um, you know if, if you look at the need or desire to make a half dozen investments uh, in the Portland area, I would say we're ideally positioned to be able to absorb this kind of investment. In fact, uh, seed angel investment has been decreasing dramatically over the last few years. Um, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> um, and the fact that we now are minting 100 companies. And let's just say 60 of those are viable. You now have a really good opportunity to uh, view a number of deals that are in your expertise, where you can effectively participate uh, in, uh, you know, in this emerging segment of our economy. And it's, you know, uh, it's a very, very uh, 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 dominant part of the Oregon economy. You know, the jobs numbers right now, tech jobs are by far the leading driver. Job recovery in Oregon, 
questions with just a few thoughts about where I think we have some issues that we need to address if we're going to really see success in sort of the, the next step in this cycle of growing big companies and, and seeing uh, wealth created. Um, when I talk to uh, CEOs pretty much across the board, um, you know, what I hear is that they have uh, job openings that are unfilled, that recruiting talent is continuing to be a uh, real challenge. And I think that, you know, I just spent the first part of this talk talking about how we've had this great influx of, of talented young people, and that's true, and that actually continues. What's happened is that we've actually grown our startup sector um, and combined that with a recovery general tech sector and economy that's more than absorbed those, uh, those uh, individuals. You know, right now, if you can spell Ruby, you can get a job. <laughs> Um, you know, there's, uh, there's just, I don't know of a single company uh, that right now that's in a growth period that doesn't have at least a dozen uh, job offers that, that are job openings right now that are unfilled, including Mono Sweet Spot, is currently, uh, uh, you know, working very, very hard. So we need to, we need to uh, continue to do <coughs> the things that will uh, attract talent. Um, and that that is a crucial part of ensuring that we succeed through, through this next part of the cycle. And the other, the other big issue that I hear from CEOs, uh, again, pretty much across the board, is that uh, access to capital is a real hindrance to being able to grow their business. And this is not uh, unique uh, to Portland, unfortunately. Uh, nationwide, there's uh, really a dearth, I mentioned before, the fact that there's been a contraction in the, in the uh, venture arena in general. And that contraction is actually primarily in the early and middle venture stages. So what's happened is the money's concentrated itself in successful funds that tend to participate late in the company cycle. Um, so where we've had a quadrupling of seeded companies nationwide. So we've gone from 472 company, uh, seeded companies in 2009 to 1,749 companies in uh, 2012. The, at the same time, Series A cap, the first check from an institutional venture investor, has gone up less than 50%. So there is a huge number of companies out there that are going wanting for cap. Now, part of this ends up being uh, less of an impact because companies can get further with less, and especially leveraging the cloud. We've all heard. Um, and many of you are involved in startups and know that you can get a lot further with fewer dollars. Um, and many of these companies are going to succeed because they're going to find their way into profitability earlier and go. Um, but there is a, uh, a serious issue here in terms of really enabling our successful young companies to find uh, growth success and become the large company that they could be uh, because they're limited by capital. So we need to, and this is one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time on, is figuring out ways to get more capital into the organ ecosystem. But um, you know, this is an issue that we're going to have to address. And it, the problem is actually uh, exacerbated by the fact that so little money is actually under management in org. Right? The uh, if you look at this is a you know the last ten years capital under management. Um, this is uh, the uh, uh, Venture Capital Association yearbook is, is where I got this data. And I, I didn't even bother showing us compared to California because we wouldn't even be on a chart, right? I mean, uh, you know, you'd see us compared to Washington, and uh, you know, we're a couple orders of magnitude less capital under management than there is in Washington. And Washington has an order of magnitude less capital. And so, you know, what this means, going back to that A gap slide, is that our companies actually spend a lot more effort uh, going and getting capital because they have to go out of state to find that capital. And, you know, I think as we build an ecosystem, one of the things we should look forward to is getting more uh, native capital involved. Uh, and we're seeing that at the angel level, which is great, and you'll see money. And I think we need to continue to drive that and find ways to address the fact that more native capital under management will certainly benefit uh, the companies that are growing and staying here in Oregon. So 
you know, that, that's really what I wanted to share. I know you, you want to get to uh, get to the companies that are presenting, and I'll take a few questions. Um, I wanted to, to share with you some of the, the, the stats and data. Uh, I hope that that reinforced some of the things that you're seeing in terms of valuations uh, and uh, the dynamics of, of uh, capital. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, I guess the, the thing I would uh, end with is just to say, you know, that in the last five years, I've been astounded by what we've been able to achieve in the greater Portland area in terms of driving tech startups. I was involved in the early 90s in the internet boom. I actually founded the company in 1994 in the Bay Area. And uh, the feeling that Portland has right now is very, very similar to what I felt when we were in uh, San Francisco in 94, right? You've got a lot of talented people very excited about how technology is changing the way we're doing things and just finding our feet in terms of how we can make an impact. Um, and I think, uh, you know, ho hopefully you can see ways that participating in that really can uh, lead to some really good returns and wealth creation. And uh, with that, I'll uh, we'll create some questions. Yeah, Ken? Hey, Chris, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on the Series A gap, as I'll be speaking later about a company in the Series A gap. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you talked a little bit about this happening and you want to see more, but how do you think it's going to resolve? Because this is a nationwide issue. It is absolutely a nationwide issue. Um, the, uh, well, the, the, the way it's being addressed, I mean, the, the, the dynamic is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, a little unfortunate in that as venture funds have contracted, what's happened with limited partners who are finding themselves allocating less and less of their capital to, um, to private equity because of that trailing 10-year returns being, uh, being bad, right? And so what they're doing is they're concentrating that investment among a few very successful funds, which continue to get bigger and bigger. And they're the people you can Greylock, Sequoia, Excel, you know, Kleiner. Um, those guys are having no problem raising big funds, and it's putting them in a position where they have to continue to put big amounts of money to work, right? So, um, you know, the uh, uh, Scott uh, over at Urban Airship, right, just got a growth check from August, right, out of their growth fund. And he didn't have a hard time getting it, right? He got a good valuation, everything was sweet. August, at the same time, though, was not writing any Series A checks, especially in Portland, right, just because of the dynamics of it. Uh, that represents a great opportunity for somebody. And what's happening is there's funds emerging that are focusing just on that A gap that are finding a lot of success. So uh, True, I think OEN had an event just on uh, Thursday last week where True was in town. Um, and True Ventures is a Series A investor, right? That's the model of their fund. They come in early, and they're finding a lot of success, right? They're actually doing very well. They're returning uh, to their limiteds, you know, uh, in, with numbers that are, are well into the upper echelons of, of venture funds. That's going to breed more early stage funds. So I think we're going to see that kind of, you know, come into this. It's going to take, take some time. So I think the gap is going to exist for a while. Uh, one of the things that uh, we can do as startup entrepreneurs is respond to that in two ways. One is to know that we have to get our early cash to take us further. Uh, one thing I would advise looking at is actually taking more seed funding, right? Do a larger seed round than you otherwise would. Seed money is, uh, is more available than that early stage venture money, right? And rather than doing a $300,000 round, think about doing a $500,000 round. Right? There's more dilution involved in that, but it gives you more of a runway, right? And oftentimes you can, uh, you know, get get that. But that's one way to respond to it is go, you know, develop your plan so you go longer, so that you're, you know, weighted earlier, and anticipate that that is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to take you more time to get it. The other thing is know that when you're doing an early round like that, go to people who are writing early checks and don't spend a lot of time uh, talking to uh, later stage investors. Right, I think, uh, and actually, I, you know, uh, uh, Scott Kavitin at Urban talked about that last Thursday in the OEN session, where you know he he did he was 0 for 30 in his first 30 pitches to venture funds, and he finally found Panit um, uh, at True, who was in the stage that he was looking for, right, was able to kind of make that make that marriage. So, yeah, the, and just credit where credit is due. That was a TAO 
event, not an OEA event. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to take credit for a great event that TAO put on. Okay. <laughs> Happy to give TAO the props. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel that angel investment is only? Yeah, I'd be successful in that area. Actually, I'm seeing successful angel investing across the board. I'm involved in startups, and one of the reasons why I love startups is because we uh, support all industries with our member companies. So I've gotten the chance. Uh, I know tech, right? That's where I come from. Uh, that's what I focus on. Um, but you know, we've had, you know, we've seen very successful food companies, uh, uh, active clothing companies, specialty manufacturing, green technology, and I think that we've got, and, and again. The, the robustness of the Oregon ecosystem is that we've got a lot of industries represented that you don't find in San Francisco, right? Which I think is, is really cool. I mean, for me, back to that main point of investing what you know, right? I, you know, I, I just wouldn't write a check to a clothing company because I just don't know, right? But I think absolutely there is uh, there is money to be made and being made in startups across the board. Yeah. Are any of these B corporations, or is that just the work that's in the solution? I'm sorry, say it again. The B corporations? Yeah. Um, again, actually, I've, I've seen a number of B corps, um, and it, it, it's not my area of of, uh, of expertise. I think, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I don't have, I don't have a lot to say on B corps. Uh, the, uh, you know, one one thing I would say is I think that. Uh, Portland companies and Oregon companies are getting a little smarter as startups that, um, you know, there's, uh, there was a tendency five years ago for startups to a bit undershoot opportunities, right? One of the things that if you're looking to be a growth startup, one of the things you want to do is posture for growth from the beginning. So, you know, I always recommend to companies that, look, if you really know you've got a market segment to go after in a big way, then, you know, do a C Corp out of the gate. You know, incorporate in Delaware right from day one. Set the company up so that you're messaging to potential employees, to potential investors, to partners that in fact you're in this, you know, for real. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, and I, I've seen more of that, you know, with especially uh, companies coming out of incubators like Pi and the, the Nike Plus, and uh, you know, I know we've got a lot of good mentorship in the uh, in the boot camp here. That if you're thinking that way, right, that you know, I, I think you need to move more boldly that way. And if you're not, you know, if you're looking at doing something that, that you want to have smaller but successful, that's great, right? You can do that out of the gate. But I think, you know, that, that in-between is, you know, in the past, we kind of stumbled a little bit on that. Yeah? Um, I know some states are working to try to allow opportunities for non-accredited investors mm -hmm. uh, to be able to invest their money. Um, is there any efforts in Oregon to be able to widen the pie so that people who have assets less than a million yeah. Participate in yeah, I know, and again, I, I don't really have the expertise to talk to that specifically. I know of efforts and I've seen efforts around cloud funding, and I know that there's actually a couple of cloud funding platforms that are coming out of the Portland area, specifically around aggregating investments for, um, you know, there's some restrictions on that as to how much money you can raise. And um, So I, I think, uh, you know, on the one hand, the, uh, the Jobs Act, which includes elements that are, are loosening up the, the restrictions a bit, um, are a good thing overall. Um, I think that it's going to take a couple of years to sort itself out. Um, you know, one of the things I've heard from uh, uh, from CEOs is that the uh, the rules are changing, and therefore they're having to spend energy adapting to that. Right? There's additional reporting requirements. There's some penalties if you don't report the right things. Um, you know, so there, there's you know I, th I think there's some some uh, negative things associated with it. But I think in the long run, as it kind of sorts itself out, we will see more available. And actually, more importantly, we'll see people being able to get involved as investors earlier, right? Which is which is very important. Yeah. So you spend time with a startup, so you've been on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me some idea as uh, an angel investor what you would as as a, as a CEO what you would like to see as involvement from your mm -hmm. uh, angel investors? Which if it's through Gordon Venture or something, it could be fifty people uh, right. potentially. Yeah, I think, um, well, the two things that are that are most valuable, to put my entrepreneur hat on for a minute, one is, if I have your cell phone number and I know what you've done in the past, that as I hit challenges that I think you might be able to provide some insight on, I can reach out to you, that's really useful. Um, and, you know, and if you're investing in something that you know, generally you're going to have that kind of expertise. So having investors.
investors that can also act as advisors, um, and not in an overly formal way, but that you know, as the entrepreneur has issues, they can use that as a sounding board. A lot of times, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs find themselves in a position where they don't have a lot of people to talk to, and that's why the mentorship programs that are been, uh, you know that are that are emerging are fantastic because you do get into situations where, frankly, you don't want to necessarily show all your dirty laundry to your broader board or investor group. You want to be able to work through those issues ahead of time. You don't necessarily want to share them with your employees. Right? So being able to act as a sounding board that can assist in that is great. And then you know the other thing that's most valuable is if you bring contacts in the industry, right? There's just nothing more valuable than that. Um, and a lot of times uh, an entrepreneur won't necessarily know that. Right? They won't necessarily know what your Rolodex looks like. They won't necessarily know you know someone who you know it, it, who is was a buyer of board streams or you know whatever those things are that, that can add value to the business. That I think those are the, the two things that um, and by doing that you can also be involved in the company and have better insight into where they're going, what they're doing, and how your investments are. Other questions? 